I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. We have a great show for you on this Friday night, including an update on the OLCC and those hard to find bottles of whiskey, bourbon, and tequila. Your chance of getting one just got better. But first, let's meet one of the candidates, one of the major candidates for mayor in the city of Portland. We'll get an update on the city's stalled camping ban. Those are our big stories tonight. By this time next year, Portland will have an entirely new form of government and a new mayor. Over the next few weeks, we'll hear from the major candidates with Blair Best honing in on their strategies when it comes to the homeless crisis. Tonight, Blair sits down with Mingus Maps. Uh, improving, but still troubled. As a longtime Portlander, city commissioner and mayoral candidate Mingus Maps can't say he's proud of what Portland has become. If we don't get better fast, the city could fail. This is an inflection point for Portland. On your campaign website, it says, I have a vision to make Portland the best run city in the United States. What is that vision? Oh, great. Well, this is a unique opportunity and moment in the history of Portland. One of the things that will happen on January 1st, uh, 2025, is that we'll have a new form of government. One of the things that we have to do is, you know, all 24 bureaus within the city have to be synced up and working and pulling in the same direction. And that historically has not been the way Portland operates. And frankly, that's one of the reasons why downtown Portland in particular looks the way it does. So under your leadership, if elected, will people still be sleeping on the sidewalks? Uh, we are going to see every year we're going to see fewer and fewer people sleeping on the sidewalks. You know, this problem has exploded uh, over the last several years. The metric I'm committed to holding myself accountable to is seeing the absolute number of people who are sleeping on our sidewalks decrease over time. I'd like to see it shrink by at least half in our first four years. And I know a lot of people will... Um, be skeptical of that. I will tell you that's actually achievable. So you talk about continuing to remove camps. Yep. But what about a place for them to go? Absolutely. Well, this is an important thing. You know, what we've got 6,000 people sleeping on the streets, probably in about 1,000 camps. Right now, the city is probably moving about 500 camps a month. Um, and every time we go out to a camp, or to an RV, uh, we let folks know, listen, you need to move here. Uh, we tried to connect them with services. Even though services are limited, he points to the city-led tiny home villages as part of the solution. He wants to make that program a county responsibility. One of the conversations that the next mayor needs to have is to make sure that the county takes over this work so that, you know, I and future commissioners on council can focus in on parks and roads and I'm delivering safe water and keeping our rivers clean. And is it really just financial reasons that you'd want the county to take all of that over? Well, number one, this is a really appropriately their, their work. You know, this, the city does the, the things that are on the names of our bureaus, parks, uh, water, cops, fire. Uh, human services really isn't part of our portfolio. In the last couple of years, we've gotten into that work frankly, because the county has struggled so much. Um, that's bad government. Um, and frankly, we're not really well equipped for this. And we don't have, you know, we don't have the funding for it. One of the reasons why we are in this economic challenge is that we are investing tens of millions of dollars in houseless services that, frankly, the county should be providing. And I'd be happy to do that um, if there was need out there, which there is, or if the county were broke. But the county's not broke. The county is sitting on hundreds of millions of unspent dollars that should be serving this population. They need to get those dollars out the door. And we've heard this rhetoric before. Do you really think you can get through to the current leadership at the county? Well, I actually am optimistic. Uh, right now, one of the things to remember is that elections matter, and uh, I believe everybody, pretty much everybody over on the county board is up for election in May. So I encourage every Portlander and every Multnomah County uh, voter to pay a lot of attention to the folks who are going to be uh, uh, um, on that ballot. Uh, who you choose is really going to make a huge difference in what the future of the um, county and the city looks like. The other thing is, is I do, to be fair, um, you know, the current county chair has only been in that position for about a year or so. I think we all uh, approach public work with a lot of idealism and whatnot, and then your idealism meets re reality. and and you need to adjust. I see the county adjusting here. Um, I do think there are some core um, differences in our worldviews that uh, explain why the county chair um, 
behaves differently and makes different choices than I would uh, uh, make. At the same time, I do see an overlap in our core goals. And just lastly here, what do you have to say about people who have just completely lost faith in our local government? I hear you, and I'll tell you, um, elections matter. We have to make some choices about uh, what our future is going to look like. If we stick with the status quo and allow folks to, um, frankly, die in our streets by the hundreds every year, um, Portland will be a ghost town. You know, Detroit will be our future. Uh, that does not need to be our future. Frankly, I believe that Portland is one of the best cities in North America. Uh, we've came through some challenges, but we can be in the lead again, and I'm deeply committed to making sure that we get there. Blair joins me now. Super interesting. I'm looking forward to this. You're going to interview all the major candidates, right? That's right. We have invites out, and we're talking with Commissioner Carmen Rubio later on this month, and we are still waiting to hear back uh, from Renee Gonzalez. And I know the campaigns are underway, and MAPS has an interesting path. He's almost out of money, mm -hmm. but still, you can't just put it all on the county. But he does have somewhat of a point, because the city's hands are limited in many ways when it comes to what they can realistically do when it comes to larger homeless policies. I mean, for example, those safe rest villages, and tiny home villages, the majority of the funding for those comes from the county. Yeah, and I know that years ago they did split it up. The county took human services, the city, business development, and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But still, as a leader, I think you got to do something. And we see that in the current administration, mm -hmm. the city leaders, that MAPS is one of those putting money forward. And so they've got to do something with that. And for example, the camping ban that's going on right now, what's the latest on that? Yeah, there was just a recent update. But first, for some backgrounds here, the daytime ban on camping would uh, make it so homeless people could not stay on most public property from 8 in the morning to 8 at night. Now, those who violate that rule would face fines or jail time. But back in November, just days before the enforcement piece was set to start, a judge blocked that from happening, ruling against the city, arguing the constitutionality of the ban. Now, the city asked the Oregon Supreme Court to step in and require the judge to provide a more detailed explanation as to why, and they just learned that the Supreme Court denied the city's request. So the city tells us they're exploring all their options on how to move forward here. The mayor's office sent us this statement today saying the city learned about the order yesterday and is disappointed in the lack of judicial guidance from the court, and they are exploring numerous potential pathways forward and will follow up as plans further develop. So... We'll see, Pat. Very interesting. We're still waiting for this big Supreme Court ruling. Mm -hmm. They're going to hear the argument out of Grant's Pass, and that may change the whole landscape. Yeah, a lot of moving parts. All right. Thanks, Blair. Great stuff, as always. Moving on to the state legislature. Oregon lawmakers are home tonight after wrapping up the 2024 short session, three days ahead of schedule. We're not shy about hammering them when they're dysfunctional, but I really got to say, this session was tremendously productive, and both the Republicans and Democrats worked well together to get some big legislation passed. Probably the biggest thing for most people in the Portland area is the rollback of Measure 110. It comes in the form of House Bill 4002. In a statement last night, Governor Kotek said she does intend to sign that bill. It recriminalizes all hard drugs statewide, even user amounts, and it makes it easier to arrest and prosecute drug dealers. It also offers several deflection chances to keep people found with drugs from going through the court system if they choose treatment instead. The recriminalization does not start for about six months until September 1st. That's to give treatment systems a chance to gear up and be ready to help out. Another big policy involved housing. That one was contained in Senate Bills 1537 and 1530. They include funding for local counties to help with infrastructure needed for housing. It also sets up a statewide office to streamline the building process across Oregon. It pays for some homeless services, and it also allows cities a one-time expansion of their urban growth boundary. The biggest possible expansion is 300 acres in the metro area. We'll be watching for that. Another big policy bill that passed is a limit on campaign finance, finance contributions. This is the first time that lawmakers have passed a bill on campaign finance in, get this, 150 years. Yeah, ever. So, yeah, kind of a big deal. We covered that extensively earlier this week. You can find that segment on the KGW YouTube channel in case you missed it. But there were a few high-profile bills that did not make it across the finish line. One of them was Senate Bill 1548. That would have started the process to ditch daylight saving time and go to permanent time instead if Washington and California followed suit. 
Well, that bill passed the Senate, but then it, well, ran out of time, did not get a vote in the House. Another bill that died would have banned book bans in Oregon. Senator Lou Frederick pushed that law. He said it's needed as a reaction to national groups trying to discriminate against LGBTQ communities and people of color. That bill also passed the Senate and did not get a vote in the House. The other big one that I wanted to mention would have put in place strict new rules of co corporate ownership of primary care and specialty medical clinics. The purchase of Portland-based One Medical by Amazon is an example of what would have been prohibited. Lawmakers wanted to make sure that doctors owned at least 51% of the business to ensure that corporate profits don't get in the way of patient care decisions. But that bill also did not survive. Lawmakers met with reporters around 9 o'clock last night after the session wrapped up. They feel very good about what they accomplished. We came into this session uh, with um, big agenda items around homelessness and housing and the drug crisis. Uh, and I think, you know, we're really, really proud of being able to have bipartisan measures in both those big, huge things and how well we work together. And I am incredibly proud of my caucus and um, how we came through this session. And um, it's challenging to feel disappointed about a session when we set our clear priorities out and achieved all of those priorities. The big challenges that are facing our communities, that's what we, it's a 35 day session. We knew that there were gonna be some things that wouldn't you know, make it through, but we, at the end of the day, we had to deliver on housing and homelessness and behavioral health care and addiction and public safety. And those were the things that and as our jobs as leaders were those big priorities. Hard to argue with that. They got it done. That rep you just heard, by the way, is the next Speaker of the House as former Speaker Dan Rayfield stepped down amid his run to be Oregon's next Attorney General. Lawmakers did have the advantage of not dealing with hot button issues that came forward during the last session in 2023. That included a sweeping bill to expand access to abortion and transgender health care and another involving ghost guns. Those bills back then prompted Republicans in the Senate to walk out for six weeks. That was the longest legislative boycott in Oregon history. But the results this time around, 32-day session that brought impressive results. I would say that we came into this session with some pretty big agenda items um, on our to-do list. And what we got done was probably one of the most historic and largest short sessions that we have ever had. Proud to have been a part of it. Um, we tackled the things that we said we were thinking of, housing and homelessness. Check that off the list when it comes to behavioral health, the addiction crisis. Check that off the list. Even the things that people thought were impossible, campaign finance reform, check that off the list. And we did even more than that. We were investing in communities across the state. Rolling up our sleeves, getting back to work, and then starting the process, leveraging our interim committees and just keeping it going. So it's, it's an interesting opportunity to have a short legislative session. I'm, you know, I have history around here, too, where it was the long session, it went forever, and then, you know, we'll see you in 18 months. And instead, now it's really with annual legislative sessions, the work just keeps going. All right, and speaking of which, something that lawmakers are already hinting about for the next year's legislature, funding for transportation. The state wants to find a new way to bring tax money into the Department of Transportation. I am pretty sure that means an over-the-road per-mile tax idea that's been floating around for a few years now. We're going to keep an eye out for that, as well as any tolling developments that could be discussed ahead of 2026 when the governor's pause on new tolls expires. So heads up on that. Coming up next on the story, huge environmental news this week in Oregon. The so-called Habitat Conservation Plan took a big step forward in an effort to conserve land for endangered species. But it limits timber harvest on state land. And you can bet the logging industry has something to say about that. You'll hear it when the story returns.
The state of Oregon is moving ahead with a controversial plan meant to protect endangered species. You may have heard of it. It's called the Habitat Conservation Plan. It passed this week barely on a four to three vote. So why is saving endangered species so controversial? Well, because there's going to be some big time limits on timber harvesting on state forest lands. We're talking hundreds of thousands of acres, predominantly in Tillamook and Clatsop counties. And you can bet the timber industry is less than thrilled. Thomas Schultz has our story. And I vote uh, yes as well. And with that, the motion passes. After decades of discussion, the Oregon Board of Forestry finally passed a habitat conservation plan Thursday. A controversial plan dozens of loggers and families protested. The HCP sets aside 700,000 acres of land for endangered species habitats over the next 70 years and comes after the state was hit with lawsuits which claim Oregon violated the Federal Endangered Species Act by destroying endangered species habitats when land was sold for logging. We need some protection from the lawsuits uh, that, that happen. Oregon Board of Forestry Chair Jim Kelly voted for the plan in a 4-3 to three decision. Still, many in the timber industry say the plan hurts their wood supply. It's a sad day for Oregon. Oregon Forest Industries Council balanced. President Chris Edwards says the decision will cut state forest harvest by a third. Kelly disagrees and says harvest will be cut between 15 to 25 percent. Regardless, there's concern jobs will be lost. We anticipate that there will be more mill closures. Already, Hampton Lumber closed a mill in banks because of the plan. And a spokesperson for Hampton Lumber says other companies will likely have to close mills too. This decision is layered on top of other things that have been really impactful to the sector over the last few years. Things like 2020 wildfires and an accord between environmentalists and the timber industry to protect species. And this decision comes after hundreds of mills shuttered statewide over the past 35 years. And Kelly says companies' concerns are valid. There's nobody who's really wrong in this. Still, he adds, the forestry department has spent decades cultivating a plan. And if they don't create protocols in line with the Endangered Species Act, lawsuits currently stayed in court could resume in 2028. And with the clock ticking, Kelly says the board had to act. Most people agree the concept of an HCP uh, habitat conservation plan is a good one. And Kelly expects the plan to go into effect early next year after receiving federal input. Another concern raised is tax revenue, which is heavily impacted by the timber industry in Tillamook and Clatsop County. Though Kelly is optimistic the state legislature will fill holes in county budgets from lost revenue in next year's legislative cycle. Thomas Schultz, KGW News. Thank you, Thomas. Coming up next on the story, the so-called Bourbon Gate scandal rocked Oregon's Liquor and Cannabis Commission about a year ago. Several officials at the agency were accused of diverting rare spirits to themselves instead of giving the public a chance to buy them in lotteries. Well, now the OLCC has relaunched the chance to purchase lottery. We have all the details, including new safeguards to protect from a Bourbon Gate round two when the story returns.
This year, the KGW Great Food Drive has a goal to collect enough donations to provide more than a million meals for local families in need. One way to help, give online at kgw.com slash food drive. It really does make a difference. Last year, almost two million people in Oregon and Southwest Washington sought food assistance from the Oregon Food Bank Network. A $10 donation can provide as many as 30 meals. And all this week, Rivermark Credit Union will match the first $5,000 donated. We also want to thank local Toyota dealers, Pacific Office Automation, and Safeway for helping us make this year's drive a great success. In the wake of last year's Bourbon Gate at the Oregon Liquor and Cannabis Commission, where the officials nabbed rare spirits before the public had a chance, remember that? The agency is now bringing back their lottery program for the public with some new internal safeguards. They call it the Chance to Purchase program, and starting Monday, there'll be a page on OLCC's website where Oregonians who are 21 and older with a valid Oregon-issued ID can enter their name for a chance to buy some rare bottles of a variety of booze. If you're chosen, you don't win the bottle for free, but you do win the chance to pay for it. The OLCC has been doing this since 2018, kind of randomly holding drawings for a handful of bottles at a time, sometimes up to a few dozen, but this time, this time, they're going all out. Um, there are a total of 354 bottles up for grabs, which is an incredible number by itself, um, but also 16 different products. Uh, so everything from whiskey, um, we got some tequila this time. So, so that is an amazing thing for Oregonians. It opens again Monday, uh, March 11th, and closes then six days later on March 17th. Uh, and so what, that, what really sets up for Oregonians is the chance to get a hold of some rare and limited edition liquors. And, uh, you know, this is something that we're proud, we're proud to bring back. Pretty cool if you're into that alcohol. They'll have a little bit of everything up for grabs, including George T. Stagg, Pappy Van Winkle, Eagle Rare, the list goes on. But in order to avoid another Bourbon Gate scandal, the agency also has a number of changes to ensure that Oregonians have equal chance to buy some of these limited spirits. Uh, number one, there's four different drawings per year now. Before it was kind of haphazard and random. Well, now there's four. Uh, we know exactly when they're going to be what months, so that's set out. So it's a lot of predictability there. And also in the drawing process itself, uh, there's now going to be outside audit involved. So it's not going to be a black box where everything is thrown in. There's going to be oversight uh, from outsider agency, which is brought in to actually oversee that process as well, too. And, uh, you know, what's probably the biggest thing is that now we have internal policy and procedure in place to guide how this product is being received and allocate within the agency. So right now we know exactly what comes in for these rare limited edition products, you know, what goes to liquor stores, what goes to chance to purchase, and then also what we're hanging on to for what we call safety stock, which is like to account for the breaks and, you know, the things that happen in shipment. So, you know, before that didn't exist and now it does. So what that really gives Oregonians is assurance that, uh, you know, the product is being accounted for and what's available to them is actually what we say is available. And uh, that should give a lot more opportunity. There's also a change in how many bottles you're eligible to win in the past. With the previous rules, one person could, in theory, be chosen for the chance to buy every single bottle available. But this time around, after you select your top five choices, if you're chosen for one of them, you're immediately disqualified from the other four that you were hoping for. So you can only buy the one. And going beyond just the liquor lottery, the Bourbon Gate scandal also prompted changes all across the OLCC to try and prevent something like this from ever happening again. Our agency has gone through a top-down transformation. We have a whole new leadership team. And uh, also staff has all been through a government ethics training. Uh, this is put on the board of the Government Ethics Commission. And so that's something all staff has been through, all commissioners have been through. And we're really embracing a new culture from the top-down that sounds good to hear. Again, the booze lottery opens on Monday morning at 9 a.m. You can look for it on the OLCC website. Well, that's it for our show and another week wrapped up. Thanks so much for watching. And remember the story, our collective story that never ends. It just goes on and on and on. I hope that you enjoy your weekend. I know I'm going to enjoy mine. And then I'll see you right back here on Monday night at 630.